I, for everyone who's here, thank you for attending and thank you for being here in like American time fairly early. Um, CSDMS, the Community Surface Dynamics Modeling System has been hosting these webinars as a resource for the community. And um, today our speaker Anders Levermann, um, who is at Potsdam uh, in Germany, um, sort of straddles this really interesting place where he looks at ice sheet dynamics and ice ocean interaction in modeling world and a lot of like of his students and collaborators also like work on like data sets, etc. But then with a very uh, clear perception of also thinking about policy implications, sea level rise. And so a lot of the, the research that has been going on in Anders um, last, I guess, like two decades already, because it's been such an important topic uh, over the last 20 years. Um, has been on like how do we bring this information about uncertainty and sea level rise and uh, ice sheet dynamics to like things that are usable for policymakers, um, and has been very successful with that. And we thought this was like really a timely um, topic to discuss again, uh, since like quite a bit of instabilities in the Antarctic ice sheets are being observed right now. Um, and so it's interesting for, for those people who work on the surface dynamics to sort of hear the perspective of what can we expect there um, and what are sort of the big questions that that community grapples with. Um, Anders um, has a interesting position at the University of Potsdam as head of a large institute on like complexity and of climate dynamics, which is like a far larger topic. And some of the uh, things that go on in his research group go far beyond what he will be talking uh, about today. So with that, I would like to give the shared screen, I guess, in this case, uh, to Anders Levermann. And thank you so much for like joining us. Yes, thank you very much for, for having me. I'm, I'm going to go through a, a few papers um, that we did on Antarctica, and I'll always try to, you know, um, highlight obviously who are the, the co-authors because they have doing most of the work uh, in most cases. So um, I'm, I'm, I hope that, that this can be of some interest. Uh, I will first go for long-term sea level rise contributions from Antarctica and then go to to shorter scales and I will actually switch from, um, from a purely numerical simulations to a combination of numerical simulations with so-called uh, a linear response theory in order to um, you know, um, capture the uncertainty that's there. And I'm really, I would be really happy if we could have a lively discussion afterward because as was mentioned before, I'm, um, I'm heading the, the research department of complexity science and we are um, at least half of my work is on the propagation of um, extreme of this economic signal of extreme weather events along the global trade network, uh, a complex network. Um, and we, um, we are really in next to trying to do good research. We are, we are also interested in how to communicate this to the to, to governments, to, to industry mainly, and to the general public. And um, this is um, something that's very interesting to discuss with, with, you know, for example, you. But let's first go through the, um, the physics of the, of the talk. Um, there, we, we, two years ago, we, they, they allowed us to have the cover of, of Nature with our paper by Julius Garb, who is also listening in here, as I saw earlier. And um, the uh, you know who was a PhD student of Ricarda Winkelmann um, on the hysteresis of the Antarctic ice sheet. And um, I don't know how familiar you are with these physical concepts like a hysteresis. A hysteresis is kind of a memory of a system. So if a system um, is undergoing a change due to a change in external perturbation or an external in the boundary conditions. And then um, when you go the same path in the change in the boundary conditions backwards again, uh, and it, the system follows a different path, then you have a hysteresis. And you can find this in the Antarctic ice sheet, similar to the Greenland ice sheet. But let me first very briefly mention what kind of model is used here. You can see um, Antarctica is really big, right? It's as big as North America from 
Mexico to Canada. Um, it's a continent in the southern hemisphere around the South Pole, and it has an ice sheet that's covered by, uh, well, uh, it, the continent is covered by an ice sheet of up to 4,000 meters in height. Um, Ed Bueller and um, Ed Jet Brown from Alaska University built a model that was quite special in 2009. They built a hybrid model with two shallow approximations of the flow dynamics or the ice flow dynamics. The ice flow dynamics are actually, uh, the, the ice is actually not modeled as a solid because if you, you, know, you, you, only, you would only model it as a solid if you're interested in how it sounds, but you don't want to know how it sounds under global warming or under the change of climate over the last um, millennia or even um, millions of years, you are interested how it, how it evolves its surface under the uh, under changing boundary conditions, such as warming on the surface, warming of the ocean. Um, and therefore, you, um, you model an ice sheet as a flow, as a fluid, with a highly nonlinear flow law. And there are two shallow approximations for ice sheet dynamics. One is the shallow ice approximation, which is generally used for the ice sheet that is grounded, that is you know, frozen to the bedrock. And then there's a shallow shelf approximation, which is generally used for the shelf, uh, which is ice that is floating on the ocean, land ice that's floating on the ocean. Uh, Bueller and Brown had the idea that you could actually use the shallow shelf approximation for the fast flowing ice streams in Antarctica, or actually on, in Greenland, first of all. Ricarda Winkelmann, during her PhD that she, that she did with, with in my group, uh, she adapted this model to, uh, to Antarctica, from Greenland to Antarctica. And then we did a number of um, changes um, over the years, and we are co-developers now together with Alaska of this model. Um, just to, to show you, this is really an old an old animation, just to to, um, to illustrate, you know, how these these are snowflakes that are you know um, flowing along the flow lines of, of the of the model. Um, just to give you a hint of, of um, that we do numerical simulations of, of these kinds. This is a typical sheet shelf system in Antarctica. Um, you see a number of, uh, of points here. This is, um, is, you can see the shelf that is floating. You can see the sheet that's grounded. You see the bedrock where it actually is grounded on um, an, an ice sheet. And I don't know how, how familiar you are with these. An, an ice sheet is generally um, you know, generated, created by snowfall. Um, onto land and then it slowly is compacted to an, to ice the snow and then um, you know it's growing over millennia tens of millennia um even hundreds of millennia and this is what happened to antarctica then this ice is flowing into the ocean under its own gravity and its own um, yeah under the gravity and it's the pressure that is caused by by um by its own weight it's flowing towards the side um following these um, the so-called Stokes equation, which is then, which then can be approximated by the two shallow approximations that I mentioned earlier. And since the um, the bed on it, on which it is grounded, generally eventually will become, uh, you know, um, an ocean floor. It will go very deep down, and that means if eventually the the ice that is, you know, generated on land and is flowing into into this direction will become too thin and will not be supported by the ground anymore at this moment it becomes an ice shelf and due to Archimedes principle it has already displaced all the uh, all the water in the ocean that it, that late that it will take later take it, it, it will take the place of the of this water so there's no more sea level rise after the ice has crossed the so-called grounding line that you see here so this is you know um this is just to give you some hint of what we are modeling and now I'll, I'll take a, a bit of time to show you the hysteresis. This is a relatively complicated figure, but what you should see is, uh, what you should concentrate on first is the sea level, the sea level equivalent of the ice volume in the Antarctic ice sheet plotted here on the y-axis. You can see that, um, you know, at, at, and on the y and the x-axis, there's the global mean temperature change compared to the pre-industrial. And you see here, this is the zero line. This is the regional surface temperature that is directly translated into global mean temperature change. 
And you can see this is the point where we start our well, this is where we are currently at this small triangle here. Uh, 55 meters of sea, global sea level rise equivalent is stored roughly on Antarctica. And um, if we now increase the temperature of the Antarctic ice sheet around the Antarctic ice sheet, then we follow this line here, the, the upper blue curve, um, the, the gray lines here are different model setups, um, middle, a different parameter um, situation, different parameter settings for the model. And if we do this gradually, then we are going through quasi-equilibrium states and we follow the path down here. So um, and at, at, at a temperature of about 10 um, degrees, 11 degrees of global warming, we'll have eliminated the entire Antarctic ice sheet basically at 14, we're really at zero. And if we go back now, starting from up from a, a situation without an ice sheet, and we go down, down with the temperature again, then we'll follow the, another path. And that is what's actually called the hysteresis here, that, there's, that we follow another path, um, a different path from the one that we actually followed when we went down. And the difference between these two paths is, uh, is the so-called hysteresis. If you really let the model run, we, we, we change the temperature here very gradually. Um, you can see here the different speeds by which we change the temperature. So uh, one in a thousand, one in 10,000 um, degrees Celsius per year. Um, if you will let them let the ice sheet run into equilibrium, you actually get the triangles here, but there's still a hysteresis in the difference between the upper branch and the lower branch. And, and um, you know, I would like, just because it's nice to see, I would like to show you this um, animation of, you know, um, of the simulation, of one of these simulations. You can see at the top the ice sheet and, um, and the ice thickness at different places. So we're increasing the temperature. On the on downwards here, we can see the temperature increase over time. And the um, blue curve here is on the, is illustrated on the left. It's the sea level contribution. And the um, purple line here gives the current um, sea level ice loss in gigatons per year. You can, so, you can see that initially, and we'll start this again, um, initially, the ice sheet is, as it is at the moment, fully intact, the West Antarctic ice sheet here, the East Antarctic ice sheet. And at around two degrees of global warming now, you can see that the West Antarctic ice sheet becomes unstable and is discharging all, basically all its ice, all the ice that's, that's grounded below sea level into the ocean. Then East Antarctica is quite stable for a long time. Then Another instability occurs at Wilkes Basin here in West Antarctica. And, um, and then at a warming of about seven to eight degrees, we see another purge of ice where um, the so-called surface elevation feedback that you, is also well, uh, responsible for the um, hysteresis of the Greenland ice sheet kicks in. And then basically all the ice is lost into the ocean. Now. I want to highlight here that in another study, we uh, using the same model, we associated these warmings with the amount of carbon that we put into the atmosphere. And the basic uh, statement is that if we burn all the coal that we found on the planet, oil and gas at relatively small contributions, the coal is the big part. If we burn all the coal that we found on the planet, we'll get an ice-free Antarctica and thereby an ice-free globe. That'll be 15, roughly 15 degrees of global warming. Now, if, um, if we go backwards, if we follow the hysteresis the other, uh, the other direction, you know, the downward, the, the lower branch, then you can see there's only slowly in the transantarctic mountains here, ice is slowly developing by snowfall that is accumulated to become an slowly an ice sheet. You can see high elevations here in, in the center of East Antarctica is also growing. And then there are temperatures where it suddenly goes, goes um, up, but overall the, the, the growth is more gradual um, and takes a longer time. 
I just let you digest this for a moment because it's, um, I'm talking very quickly and that might be too much. Also, we want to see the full ice sheet we gained, not at a temperature of zero degrees as uh, of, um, above the present day, but actually at a temperature of pre industrial, but at a much lower temperature of about two degrees, um, negative two degrees or negative three degrees. Let us briefly zoom into these two instabilities. I mentioned this earlier, the so-called marine ice sheet instability is very important, especially in Western Antarctica, because um, some research of 2014 indicates that this instability might have been already triggered and that we are now seeing the unfolding of this instability. Whether that is true or not remains to, or has to be further investigated, but our current state of understanding is that um, we have destabilized Western Arctica in the Amundsen Sea. Now, you know, some policymakers might think or that, well, the damage has already been caused, so we don't have to reduce uh, global warming because we already caused the sea level rise, the instability in Western Arctica, and we'll get a sea level rise of at least three meters from that. But obviously, this is not the case. First of all, it's not only sea level rise, why we need to reduce carbon emissions, but obviously there are other, and there are also further, even with respect to sea level rise, East Antarctica, for example, has an instability um, of the same, uh, with the same dynamics um, in Wilkes Basin, as you can see on the right-hand side. So this was the numerical modeling, and we could talk about this um, for a while, but let me briefly indicate the implications. Um, of these long-term results, because the the this response both oh, the response of the Greenland ice sheet and of the Antarctic ice sheet, as well as the oceanic thermal expansion that is increasing sea level worldwide, is on a multi-millennial on the multi-centennial to multi-millennial time scale. So the sea level rise that we will that we have been seeing in the last hundred years of about twenty centimeters. And the sea level rise that we are expected to see of about of the order of a meter um, in, the, in this century is by far not everything that, that, that we have already caused. And that's why we introduced this, the, the notion of, of, of so-called sea level commitment, which is kind of the, temp, the, the sea level that you will obtain in equilibrium on the long term when you elevate the temperature of the planet by one degree on the x-axis here, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees. This was in the last sea level, in the last uh, sea level chapter of the, not the last sea, um, IPCC report, but the one before that where I was a co-author. And you can see on the, on the right-hand side, the different contributions I mean, um, from the different components. In the upper corner, on the upper right-hand side, you can see the contribution by thermal expansion of the ocean. These are different so-called Earth system models of intermediate complexity, and they give an, an, a median contribution of 0.42 meters, so roughly half a meter for every degree of warming. You can see actually the dots here in the center these are not the median values of the model simulations, but these are the values that you get if you just take the observed temperature and salinity field of the world ocean and just add one degree everywhere in the ocean. And that gives you a very clear, nice line, uh, which, is, which happens to be at the center of the, of the model simulations. The second one is, um, the contribution from mountain glaciers, these is DC meters rather than meters, so it doesn't really take and uh, play an important role on the long term. Um, this the center part here is in, in panel C, you see the Greenland contribution really in equilibrium. You can see here the step function that is caused by the so-called surface elevation feedback and the hysteresis of the Greenland ice sheet. This step smears out into a uh, into a continuous function without a step. Uh, if you take any fixed time frame, so if you ask what's the sea level contribution after a thousand years or two thousand years or three thousand years, 
you will always get a smooth curve and not a step function. Only in equilibrium, you get a step function. And the reason is a so-called critical slowing down near the threshold. So the closer you are to the threshold, the slower the, the ice loss actually occurs. However, you can see the tipping point of uh, the Greenland ice sheet is around half 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming. There's an uncertainty here, obviously, but um, somewhere uh, in the Paris climate agreement range, there's this tipping point. And the, um, the fourth contribution here is from Antarctica. This is actually, these are actually simulations carried out by David Pollard and uh, Rob DeConto in, in their nature simulations, in their nature paper, um, I think 2008, uh, where they simulate the last 5 million years of Antarctica. So it's a different model, a different set of simulations than we just presented, but it's fully, it, it gives the same numbers as uh, the hysteresis simulations that I just showed you, which is quite, you know, quite nice. So we can actually, and that was one of the reasons why we considered the commitment of the sea level commitment. We can actually, well, in some cases you can make more precise statements or less uncertain statements about the equilibrium and thereby the long-term evolution um, than the, than the short-term evolution. That's, that's something that, that is interesting to discuss, in, interesting to reflect on, because we are actually, um, we are, we, we, it's, it's a different approach to ask, what is the, the amount of ice that will survive a warming of one degree, two degrees, or three degrees, than it is, how will this evolve over time? The evolution over time is much more complicated. This is just a small side note. Um, with Ben Matsoyan, we computed how much of the world cultural heritage will be underwater and at one degrees, two degrees, and three degrees, and four and five. You can see this here, and you can also see that the number of world heritage sites by the UNESCO will be that, that are underwater is actually saturating uh, you know, somewhere around three degrees because every everything that's near the coast is actually flooded. So the you know the Sans Souci in Potsdam or the uh, um, Versailles castle of Louis XIV will not be flooded. It's in the center of France. Um, now, a big question for policymakers and for adaptation purposes is not, is not just how will sea level evolve on the on, on a millennial time scale or even a centennial time scale, but how will how will the next decades look like? And that is difficult. And um, what's what's important there to, to recognize is that what I just showed you uh, were a number of simulations, but a very finite number of simulations carried either uh, carried out with either one numerical model and different parameter settings or with a um, handful of models um, and, but, and, and one um, set of boundary conditions. There, however, there, there obviously is large uncertainty both in the model between different models, between different ice sheet models, but there's also uncertainty with respect to the forcing that is uncertainty with respect to how the global mean temperature responds to um, CO2 emissions, how this temperature is, the global mean temperature is then transported to the Southern Ocean, to the world around Antarctica, and then um, how this is transported underneath the ice shelves where it can actually hit the ice sheet, and then how these um, the ice sheet will respond. That's again the ice sheet models. And in order to capture this uncertainty, we carried out um, a so an intercomparison project, and and that is now um, tackling. This is now something that that I, I did with the linear response uh, theory. And, and to this end, I would like you to revisit linear response theory very briefly. The approach of a linear response theory is that you take a system and you perturb the system with a delta function forcing. 
For example, the oceanic melting, where you, you, you increase the oceanic melting and around Antarctica for a short period of time, and then you ask, what, how does the ice sheet respond to this? Um, if you, for example, if you have a table at the moment in front of you, you can knock your hand on the table. No, not, not your hand, not your head, please. I, don't, I hope that my talk is not such that you want to knock your head on the table. So your hand on the table and you will hear a, um, a sound. Now, this is actually the response of the table to the delta function forcing of your knocking. And the table will have a very specific response. And if you hit double as hard with your, with your knuckles, you will get the same response only with a higher magnitude. And that is the linear, uh, li this is the assumption behind the linear response theory that you get uh, a linear response, not in the time evolution. The time evolution can be complicated as you can see here on the, in the lower um, panel. But um, the linearity assumption is actually in, in, in the idea that if, you, if, you, if your forcing is twice as large or three times as large, then your response will also be two times or three times as large. And for, so what we did now, we actually, um, I ask, I think more than 20 ice sheet modelers, well, I think, not sure, 19, I don't know, something like this, to, um, to do one experiment. And that is not to put a delta function warming or delta function melting underneath their ice shelves in Antarctica, but actually to do a switch on experiment. So to switch on the basal melt, an additional basal melt of one meter, well, actually of eight meters per year underneath the ice shelves. And then, uh, observe the response of the ice sheet for 200 years and just report this number back to, to me. You can imagine that if I, if I do a delta peak here, I can get, get the response function. If I do a switch on forcing here, I get the time integral of the response function. And, and you know, by time, to, by the derivative of, the, of, this, um, of this result, I will get the response function itself, which is quite easy. Right, here you can see. So, um, and, and, and once you have this response function, you can actually, and that is the big advantage, you can actually compute under the assumption of a linear response, you can compute the response of the system to any temporal evolution of the forcing through this um, convolution of the forcing M of tau and the response function with a time delay and an inversion. This is nothing else but the, the, super, the linear superposition in the limit of, infinite, of, of infinitely small time steps um, um, you know, of, of two different forcing, two, two forcing time series. So, and that's what we did. We did the switch on experiments for all the different models in five regions that you can see here. The Amundsen C region is the one where we believe there's an instability that has already been triggered. There's the Antarctic Peninsula, which is relatively small, but still, uh, you know, reaches relatively far into the north. So it's relatively warm or, you know, there's Argentina here. So it's even hot in the region, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's, um, well, and there's, there's the Weddell Sea here with all the wonderful penguins. There, there are penguins everywhere, but not over here. It's actually a Weddell penguin, I think, um, you know, named after the region. Then this huge big of, uh, part, part of uh, East Antarctica, and then the Ross region here with another entrance to the West Antarctic ice sheet. And then we did different steps. I will, I'm giving you here the um, example of the linear response of the ice loss for the Amundsen Sea sector from these, oh, it's, I can, you can see it's 16 models. I, I could have actually memorized that. Um, it's 16 models and um, we, we did a linearity check. It's not perfect, but it's, all, it's pretty much all, all right. Um, we computed this alpha here, which kind of gives you the, the, you know, the deviation from the linearity assumption. The further away from zero it is, the, uh, the, the, the worse it is. And now we, we use this 
these numerical simulations and fed them into a procedure in order to be able to capture the uncertainty of the sea level projections that arise from the different, um, different sources of uncertainty. First, we have four different socioeconomic scenarios. These are just the carbon, uh, the you know, CO2 concentration pathways that, are currently, that are, have been used for a while now um, under so different socioeconomic assumptions. These are four choices in our case here. That's RCP 2.6 all the way to um, RCP 2.6 is the blue one here, all the way to RCP um, 8.5 in red. Then we used um, 600 emulations of the global mean temperature response to this um, RCPs. These are the same that are used by the IPCC. They're derived from the so-called MAGIC model, uh, which emulates different um, CMAP so global covered climate models. This gives you um, an, an uncertainty in the global mean temperature. And then we... Um, And then we used the um, um, we used a number of CMAP um, simulations by 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 I think nine ocean models. I've, I'm 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 embarrassed. It's it's been a while, and I have forgot how many. Fourteen or nine um, ocean models, uh, a couple of climate models, where we scaled the temperature change in the the temperature change in the subsurface um, ocean around Antarctica in the different basins. And we scaled this with the change in the global mean temperature of the model. So there will be a time delay you know, between the warming at the, at the surface, the global mean temperature in the surf, uh, global mean surface air temperature change, and the subsurface oceanic warming in the different regions around Antarctica. You can see here an example. This is how the, the red, the uncertainty in the red line here in the global mean temperature translates into um, a warming signal underneath in, in the Amundsen Sea sector in the subsurface at 200 meter depth. So it's a, even a, a bigger uncertainty here, but also different magnitude because not all of the warming signal really reaches the subsurface in, uh, in, at, at time. And now we used an observed interval between uh, of, of sensitivity of the basal melt underneath the ice shelf, um, given a temperature change outside of the ice shelf um, that is in the in the region that this warming here and in the region where this warming occurs, and this is quite a large interval between seven and sixteen meters per year of extra basal melt for every degree of warming out of the ocean outside of the cavity in the subsurface around Antarctica. And now we, we have the forcing. We have the M of tau that I showed you earlier. Now we have the, the forcing and that, that we can feed into the linear response functions of the different models in the different regions of Antarctica. These, this is now where the ice sheet models comes in, uh, come to play. And um, this will then translate into um, sea level response from this region, from this model, um, from this Antarctic region, from this model for, for, for the future. These are the projections. We actually compared them to observations. It, it is actually quite, quite good. Um, you, the, uh, surprisingly good, the contribution of Antarctica is, um, even though it, it's not probably not well, you know, it's not for good reasons, but the, the contribution over the last decades that we observed from Antarctica is actually comparable to what these, you know, um, what the median of the models uh, gives. So some models don't contribute in our disease sector at all. Um, some contribute quite strongly. You can, you know, pick your favorite model. This is um, Belgium. This is England. You know, if you want to attribute a, a country to it, you know, this is France, Utrecht, which is not a country, Germany. Well, there are three, four PISM models, all different versions, New Zealand, and so on and so forth. Um, and if we take all this together, then um, 
Oh, this is complicated and I don't have time for that now. But if we take all this together, this is what we get for the different RCP scenarios. So there are different aspects to these sea level contributions from Antarctica. First of all, there's surprisingly little difference between the different emission scenarios. And that is very simply due to the fact that there is inertia in the system. There's inertia between the temperature um, change in the atmosphere on the planet. Um, and then there's a time delay for this to reach the subsurface of the Antarctic, of the Southern Ocean around Antarctica. Then there's a time delay of the ice sheet responding to the oceanic forcing. And that is why there's actually um, the, 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 um, the sea level contributions from Antarctica are actually not as far apart for RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5 as the temperature changes are. Um, in the left-hand side, you can see here the sea level change. That's also an integration over time, obviously, of the sea level contribution, which you see on the right-hand side. And in the sea level contribution, that's the rate of sea level change in centimeters per decade, you can see already a, a bigger difference between RCP 2.6 and 8.5, especially then under 2.6, you can see some kind of saturation occurring here in the contribution, the annual contribution to global sea level rise. These numbers that, that um, we obtain from this are um, similar to other estimates, especially if you look at uh, the median contribution. So let's have a look here in the 2100 median contribution for the different ice sheets. You can see something of about, 13 to 17 centimeters, which is also what the last, the previous, not the last one, but the second but last one of the sea level, uh, um, sea level chapter of the IPCC came up with. Um, the, the big contribution, or well, if there is a contribution, then the, the relevant contribution of this exercise here is to look at the uncertainty because that is what we can gain here. You know, you, you generally have the problem that if you do a model intercomparison, then you have one forcing um, that you apply to a number of models. If you do a parameter study, then you have different forcings, different parameters uh, that you apply to one model. Uh, here we try to bring these different uncertainties together. And that's why the, the important condition here is that under RCP 8.5, you can actually have a 5% uh, chance that you end up with 58 centimeters of sea level contributions from Antarctica, which would be a very high number, a uh, number that has not been obtained by, by numerical modeling in, in either in, in any of the other um, simulations, apart from if you, in, if you add the marine cliff instability by Paulette de Conto, which is basically open end. I really, I really appreciate this effort. I mean, the, the, the whole research line of research, is very important, but um, we're currently still struggling a little bit with, uh, with constraining these marine ice cliff instability. Um, and yeah, and with this, I would like to actually close my remarks and invite questions because I went through quite a bit of stuff and I hope I didn't lose you and hope that you have questions. Thank you so much, Anders. This was incredibly interesting. And um, I know that there'll be like a bunch of questions from the um, audience so i'll open it up i think we're a small enough group that we can um, people can unmute and um, ask Anders a question so please do Anders, uh, this is bob anderson um that was a wonderful talk thank you very very much it was Thanks. inspiring to see the clever use of models and response times and so on 
I, I wonder from now your decade at least of, of experience with these big models, what you think the, uh, uh, the, the part of these models that we know the least, where, where is yeah. the research opportunity? Where should we be focusing as a community on how uh, these uh, ice sheets respond to global change? I, I think, you know, there's, there's, all, there's, there's a natural, I, I, my, my, my prejudice, I'm a physicist, right? So my, my prejudice towards physicists is to myself kind of, is that we always try to solve the, the most difficult problem that we can solve. So a natural uh, uh, approach is um, to get better at simulating the, the, the ice dynamics, right? Um, because we know how to do that, right? We have the Stokes equation, we have the shallow approximations, we get, you know, we can do this better and better. However, I think in ice sheet modeling, the, the big problem is this, the physics that's not inside the models yet. And um, one aspect, and that is, again, very complicated, uh, and then that's why it's kind of an annoying, is the, the basal conditions. Right, we no. we don't have a, a very good grasp on on how the ice is uh, you know is sliding or flowing ac across the, the 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 base of the of 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 the, of the bedrock, and that's a big thing. The other is that the the fractures inside an, an ice shelf and an ice sheet and the associated butt pressing uh, associated yeah. with that. That's, that's also the whole melange world, right? right? And these are the two things where, and then obviously the, the cliff instability is, is a yeah. big unknown, but at the moment we have shelves everywhere. So I don't know why that's so important. What, what do you, what's your sense of how we're doing with, um, you know, the mantle response to the changes in load? Do we want Actually, know that well enough to, that that's not an issue? It's something that I don't know. Um, and that's why I have, you know, that I have a natural tendency to say, oh, someone knows that. But, <laughs> but if you tell me that <laughs> we don't, then, then I would try believe you. Uh, I, I feel that, that that's important to take into account. It's, it's in PISM. It's in the parallel ice sheet model, yeah. right? But whether how, how well this is done, I don't know. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We have time for another question or two, or even more. Azamat, you have your hand up. Do you want to speak up? Hi, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, putting this together and uh, for the brilliant uh, presentation. I loved it. Uh, my question is regarding the, uh, uh, you know, you showed like 14 different models. Uh, I think it was. Uh, you took the Amundsen region uh, to uh, as, as an example, and my question was, is after that one, yeah, I, yeah, particularly this one. After in your, in your next slide, you put something, I guess, like you, uh, as a result of the model intercomparison inter project, you like uh, like got or achieved a, a single result. The uh, for that would somehow I don't know, get the I don't know. My question: How did you do that? How did you? Get one picture, yeah, that this one out of sixteen different models. Is it, is it just the average of the? Uh, it's just the also? average. I, well, it's not. It's not really the average, but it's it's uh, it's the median, and the, I, I put all the models together. It's like, you know, um, it's it's a huge ensemble because we do like fifty thousand um, computations, uh, combining always one atmospheric model. In a sense, that's the global mean temperature evolution, one oceanic model, one selection of the observed sensitivity, melt sensitivity, and then one ice sheet model. That gives you one curve. And you do just 50,000 random combinations of these, and then you get this, right? It's, uh, this is really straightforward. Um, yeah. What's, what, what's at the core is this, uh, this, um, the response function part, which is quite nice actually, and it, it can be applied to a number of, of situations. We, you can do this for the ocean. Um, and you know, we did this exercise here with, with Ricarda in climate dynamics where you can actually derive um, 
analytic response functions for mixing for for one dimensional diffusion equation. Uh, so it's it's kind of a nice tool. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the answer. Albert, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. That, that was great. Um, what I, what I'm missing? So so or I th I think you touched upon this, but I I, I wonder if you have more uh, comments about this. So I think somewhere last November or December, Wild came out with a paper about the Twait Glacier um, and its instability there, and therefore sea level could rise, I think, within several decades or maybe two decades or something by another 0.6 meters. And the, the slide actually where you're, you're right on now, um, I, I don't see that back in that, you know, as a, as a response as a, in, in this um, sea level change over time. If, if you look at that, no. could you touch a little bit more upon that? Yes, no, we don't. Um, we don't get these kind of numbers. Not, uh, not, not with this, uh, with the with these kinds of weights. Um, uh, fully agree, and and that's what I kind of meant earlier. Um, we we are still with with them when when we t use the ice sheet models. Then we are constrained by the physics we have in the ice sheet models, and that means we have no. We, we don't really have a good grasp on the on the on the whole fracture world, and that includes the carving dynamics, and we don't have a good grasp on on the basal yeah. conditions. And and you know, and observationalists have have a very good point when they emphasize this and say, well, if that is fundamentally different from what you are actually modeling, then this could go much faster. It could also be slow, obviously, right? But but um, but generally, the, the obviously the risk is that it's faster. Um, there is something. Um, there's a puzzle that that is actually related to Greenland that I think still is a puzzle, and that is there was a a paper by Jörg Schäfer and colleagues um, some years ago in, in in Nature where he had worked on a beryllium. Um, method, I, and I don't understand it uh, really, but but in a beryllium isotope method to determine when um, the the base of Greenland in a in a specific location where they had drilled through the ice sheet and all the way into the bedrock, when this um, was how how long over the past two million years or so this was ice free, and his conclusion was that either it was ice free before the ice ages. Yeah, before the, the this this period, um, which was two, two million years ago, so or it must have been ice free in almost every interglacial of the past um, million years. Mm -hmm. Now that means the interglacials were typically two uh, thousand uh, ten thousand years long, right? So and and our interglacial is now ten thousand years long. So that I I, I don't think that even if the interglacials were slightly warmer than at present day, I don't think that any ice sheet model that I know of could model an ice, at like a complete meltdown of Greenland within this period with this kind of temperature increase. And that indicates that there's something wrong in the models. There's either something wrong with this beryllium measurement, mm -hmm. and I haven't followed up on the, on the discussion there, or there's something wrong with the ice sheets, ice sheet models. Yeah. And uh, yeah. That's that's a big big thing. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions still? Irina, I think there are a few questions in the chat. Oh, I've I've been looking at hands, but maybe I didn't look at the chat so much. Let me check. Thank you. Uh, um, the first question by Santiago. I I can answer. Uh, yes, they are uh, in there. The in the isostatic adjustments are in there. The, the geothermal flux is not. It's not changed, at least. And then there's a second question by Colby that is a little further down into the whole climate system. 
Colby's asked, uh, are you reading it to yeah. learners? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. So the, the question is whether there is a, whether we have um, included any kind of carbon sink uh, measurements. No, we have not, not at all, right? There's not even, there's no carbon cycle in, in this whatsoever. We have, we don't even have a feedback on the global temperature or so, where we have a feedback on the, on the local temperature in the sense that um, if the ice goes down in elevation, then it, it goes into a warmer atmosphere and thereby is further warm. This is so-called melt elevation feedback that also is responsible for the tipping of Greenland. Um, but we don't have a, you know, any, um, any loop to the carbon cycle. Risa, did you have your hand up? I, I did. I, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if he just answered the question, but I, it sort of had to do with, yeah, um, I guess feedback to temperature feedbacks, um, how how they're incorporated into the scenarios. Um, um, I mean, is, is there any way to use like just past evidence from past? Uh, I guess you'd have to use past models of climate change to see how um, warming would affect temperature and um, but but I mean how, how do how does air temperature how do air temperature feedbacks affect the scenarios? Well, the the the, um, the carbon cycle feedbacks and the air temperature feedbacks. Well, the, the carbon cycle feedbacks are out um, in in this because we we prescribe the um, the CO two concentration in the atmosphere. That's just a, a given. So with all the results that I'm I'm showing you, if I you know if I if I, if I do fish show you this, that is given the RCP 8.5 carbon in the atmosphere. It's the, because the, the RCP 8.5 is, is, is just giving a, a CO2 concentration pathway. It's not a carbon emission pathway. So the, yeah, so that's, that's number one. Um, however, the temperature feedbacks, they are included in, in the simulations through um, the different, different, the uncertainty in in this part here. Yeah. Okay, okay. And that's quite a, quite a large range, actually. Okay, thank you. Are there any last questions? I had, like one more question. Um, I, I think there's inspiring or the, when like a modeling community and in your case, it's like the ice sheet modeling community comes together and do, does these like model uh, intercomparisons. Like one that's inspiring for other modeling groups, right? And so like, it's maybe something that you can elevate to like, oh, we're doing, I don't know, landslide modeling and all the landslide modelers come together and do these like model intercomparisons and sort of the strategies that one group uses and another group uses is, is something to learn from too. And so I thought um, by sort of following along with this perturbation that you imply in all the models and then see what are all the outcomes, is it worthwhile and possible to look the other way then again and see like these are models like PRISM has dynamic calving in its like outlets. And then some of the others may have a different algorithm for dynamic calving. Is it also possible to reason backwards with an experiment like this, where you see like those models that really don't match the data then seem to be missing in these and these areas just because they don't incorporate or is that too far-fetched? Um, well, that that is, that, that might be possible. I'm um, I'm not sure whether that is actually a good uh, whether you would want to use the um, the linear response um, theory for that. Um, I think you should then directly compare to observations. I would say you 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 would have to go go this right. way, right? Yeah, um, I was thinking I, the slide that the, you were showing with the like big uh, panel that had uh, different countries, different um, yeah. and and they. So, so they have their realization and then they have in response to this perturbation 
this is how much sea level rise we would get. But you can, for the first part of the time record, you could like compare to what has been happening. So then exactly. you go back to observations. Yes, that's true. And but um, we have to be careful, obviously, because um, you know, as, as I learned from my paleoclimate colleagues, uh, there's always the, the, the question: Did you get the right answer for the good reason? Or did you get the right answer for for a bad reason? And and um, we we know where the most of the sea level contribution came from in the past, in the, over the past decades, uh, since we have satellite data at least, and that is uh, West Antarctica. So you could actually go back and really ask if if I give it the right forcing in the in the right region, do I get the right response there? But you would not be able to say much more about the rest of Antarctica because you don't have a response there. And, and what you could do is say, well, I shouldn't have a response then also in the model, right? That's something you could do. But perhaps, I'm, you know, if, if you're interested in model inner comparisons, there is something that, that might, I mean, it just came to mind. We, have, well, almost 10 years ago now, um, the Potsdam Institute has started a model into comparison for impact models and impact mm -hmm. models is quite a wide, wide variety of you know these are flood models and agricultural models and so on so they have much less rigor than the physical models that we have which means that they have to be very careful on the epistemic part of of modeling so what is it you can actually say using this model and they have a model in the comparison already now in the third round and, and they've really learned a lot uh, because it's a, it's a highly heterogeneous modeling community. So if you are interested in, in model, or if we are interested in modeling comparisons, that, that, that might actually be a good link to do, to mm -hmm. learn from them because they really have a quite different like, approach. They, they even more challenges. <laughs> yeah, right. more challenges, but, but they learn a lot from the physical community, right? Uh, but I think they're, they're mature now enough to, to, to give something back because they really have different, different problems, especially with respect to comparison to data and stuff like this. Yeah, yeah. I think that we, that uh, people are slowly signing off and qu questions are be having been answered. I wanted to thank you, Anders, for like a really interesting talk. I think a lot of us, um, feel like a bit more confident when friends will ask about the Antarctic ice sheet and the instabilities there and what, what sort of the science is telling us right now. And that's like a big um, function of something um, like this, but also these insights in like, what are like the current techniques that we are using and that what are the like sort of gaps in the knowledge still. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Take care. Thank you.